me give you a big Labor Day surprise. Most people think if we all exercise the same and eat the same, we'd all look the same. And let me tell you why that's wrong. Your body is unique and your metabolism is unique. I'm Lacey Green, and I'm a super trainer at Body. That's B-O-D-I dot com. And you can't see me, but I don't look like your average personal trainer. I'm curvy, and I'm proud of it. So I created a program for beginners only on the Body app to show people like us how to get incredible results and be our version of happy and healthy. This isn't just workout videos. It's people like you and me. It's community. It's incredible trainers. It's easy to follow nutrition and mindset experts to help you reduce stress and just feel better. And you can get started with my new program called For Beginners Only. Now, here's the big surprise. If you go to body.com right now, that's B-O-D-I dot com, not only can you get everything Body has to offer at 50% off with an annual membership, you'll also get an additional 20% off, but only during Labor Day weekend. Let's do this together. Go to body.com. That's body with an I dot com. This episode of the Duke Basketball Report podcast is brought to you by the fine gentleman of Bird Campbell, PA. Bird Campbell means business. Happy New Year, Duke fans, and welcome to episode 140 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. It is Sunday, December 30th, 2018. By the time you listen to this, who knows? It might even be 2019, which means uh, which means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. But for us, most importantly, it means that ACC basketball season is upon us, which means we have a lot to talk about here. So we will dive in very quickly. I am your host, uh, Sam Klein. I'm back in Durham from my from my winter break travels. I'm back in Durham, ready to start second semester of business school in a couple weeks. I am joined, of course, by Donald Wine, who's back home in D.C. That is correct. I am back home uh, in D.C. It's been a couple days. I've been working for a couple days. Um, Anyone who works this week uh, knows when I say that this is the worst week of the year to be working because the entire world is off and you're stuck in an office. Um, uh, So, yeah, that has been me the last few days. Uh, yeah, tell me about. Oh, sorry, I I can't relate. Uh, Jason Evans, <laughs> Jason, <laughs> Jason, you're in you're are you in Atlanta? I assume I am in Atlanta. Yeah, my kids came home to visit me, so I didn't go any place. Aw, that's so sweet of them, isn't it? Yes, I, I mean, it's <laughs> the freest place for them to go on vacation. So exactly, uh, but, but but still good on them. All right, guys, home is where the money is. <laughs> that's yeah, right. That's right. That is, that is so true. <laughs> Um, shouts to my parents. I didn't see them at all during during this winter break, um, but it seems like they're having a good time without me anyway. Okay, uh, let's talk about ACC basketball because, as I mentioned here at the top, ACC basketball season gets gets rolling in just a few days. And this year, unlike in past years, the ACC has foregone the those early season games, those awkward early season games. So everybody is is has a clean slate right now, and which which gives us a great opportunity to kind of digest the non-conference part of the schedule that has already happened or that everyone's like wrapping up right about now and then look ahead at conference play and so far this season there's been a lot of interesting developments in the ACC Uh, a lot of the teams seem to be pretty competitive and like they're able to make the tournament Um, I, I think perhaps at this point basically everyone still has a path into the tournament although it's going to be harder for some of those lower teams maybe save for Wake Forest so let's do this. In in we're gonna we're gonna break down the ACC preseason in a couple of different ways. We're gonna talk about first um, who are our predictions for which ACC teams are going to get those uh, two days of buys in the ACC tournament. So that ends up being the the top four teams in the rankings. And then we're also going so that that'll kind of get us to the to the top of the conference. And then we'll also look down at some of the surprise teams so far in the ACC. And guys, feel free to pick a team that has either overperformed or underperformed relative maybe to your preseason expectations. And we can go back and look at what the polls looked like early in the season, stuff like that to, to inform this discussion. So I'll start with Jason. Jason, why don't you tell me your prediction for the top four ACC teams at the end of the season in March? Well, there's going to be a surprise here. The first two, uh, look, everyone's going to pick Duke and Virginia. Um, and that's not surprising. They're they're the top two teams in virtually every you know metric out there. Pomeroy and everyone else like that says Duke and Virginia are the best teams in the land. So everyone 
Um, I'm sure both of you are going to take them, but but I'm about to go out on a limb a little bit. Um, the other two teams that I think will get that will finish in the top four in the ACC will be Virginia Tech and NC State. Not North Carolina, not Florida State, not Syracuse. Um, I guess those are the other major contenders here. Um, uh, maybe Louisville, Miami. Uh, but um, I, I think Flor- I, I think Virginia Tech and NC State, two of the surprising teams in the conference, will finish ahead of Carolina. And and I don't want to just throw that out there and not say why. <laughs> so the reason that I think um, NC State and Virginia Tech um, will finish ahead of UNC is that I like NC State and Virginia Tech's schedules better than UNC. And let me talk about schedules for just a second. The teams at the bottom of the conference are almost always going to have the toughest schedule. And that's because they have fewer games against the worst teams in the conference because they can't play themselves. So it's really surprising when you look at a team like NC State, who uh, who's one of the better teams in the league, and and most of the metrics will tell you that NC State actually has the easiest ACC conference, and that's because their schedule. It like if you could design a schedule for a team and say, hey, what's the easiest? What's the best schedule we could give you? You would come up with what NC State has for their schedule. The teams that NC State plays twice. Now, they play UNC twice, which is tough. Carolina's good. But the other three teams that NC State plays twice are Pitt, Wake, and BC. Um, You know, alongside Georgia Tech, those three teams are probably the three worst teams in the ACC. So they get get Pitt and Wake twice. That's a gift. Hey, Jason. Jason. Yeah. Jason. Much better than they were last year. Still not great. Uh, it, it's but right exactly better but it's still a gift to get those teams twice um uh, and then if you look at who NC State plays their their road game against uh, all their road games and road games you know that's where it's really tough to win their, their their solo road games are teams that are very beatable it's Miami Notre Dame Louisville Florida State's tough and Duke is really tough obviously but for them to get Miami, Notre Dame, Louisville as as their solo road games, and then their home games are difficult. But you you should you should win your games at home. So like Virginia and Virginia Tech, who are going to be two of the main competitors for the top of the conference, they get both those teams at home. Don't play them on the road at all. Um, they get Clemson at home. Don't play them on the road at all. Syracuse at home. Don't play them on the road. So for, NC State has a really easy schedule. And then I, I, I'm I'm getting too far into the weeds, so I'm going to wrap this up. But uh, I think Virginia, Virginia Tech. See, um, schedule there. There, the teams they play twice are Notre Dame, Georgia Tech, Miami, and Virginia. It's not the bottom of the conference, but it's not really the top, top, top of the conference. So I, I, I like Virginia Tech and NC State to finish ahead of UNC because UNC I think has a a more difficult schedule. They play Duke twice, of course. UNC plays NC State twice, um, uh, and they have Louisville and Miami as the other double opponents. Uh, and and I. I I, I just think that that's how it's going to end up. I'm not saying necessarily that Carolina is worse than NC State and Virginia Tech, but I, but I think that once the schedule has played out, I think that's how it'll turn out. Donald, Jason's got Duke, UNC, Virginia Tech, and Florida State, uh, or and, and NC State, excuse me. Um, wh- I, don't do you have I, I don't have UNC. I don't have UVA. Yeah, UVA. Man, I am I am not with it this morning. Duke, UVA, NC State, Virginia Tech. Donald, who do you have? So, as he said, Duke and UVA are the obvious picks. Um, for third, and I won't put these in any order, I'll just say top four, but Duke, Virginia, UNC, I think UNC does find a way to finish the top three because they always seem to have, even though they may have a difficult schedule, they always seem to have some games where teams just fold, um, and they, they're not necessarily easy wins on paper, uh, but they become them during the course of that game, uh, and teams just kind of, fall apart against them. Um, and then fourth, I think Florida State may be for real this year. Uh, it pains me to say that as a Miami grad, but uh, they're ninth in the country. They're 11-1. and one. Their only loss has been a Villanova. And they have some ballers who are, you know, really playing well so far this year. They went to the Elite Eight last year, um, and everyone thought it was kind of a fluke uh, that they got there. They're out here to prove that they, that, that showing from last year was no fluke. Um, and I, I think with some of these teams, they're going to they're going to knock off some of these top teams and keep themselves in the conversation uh, for, you know, being one of the top teams in the country. I think they end up as the number 14. I've I've actually got the same same top four that you do. And I wanted to come back to UNC 
for a quick second because you talked about how they always seem to find a way to end up in the top of the conference. I think they also have improvement coming. Um, you know, their, their their top freshman Nasir Little hasn't hasn't really played up to expectations yet, and there are like it basically says that to me that there's a way for UNC to look even better than they have looked early in the season, and they've gotten they've gotten a couple big wins. Right, they beat Gonzaga at home. Um, yesterday they had a good tune up against Davidson and I see, I see UNC improving through the rest of the season. I think the, the thing that, that is always tricky is that when you have teams that have younger contributors and obviously as Duke fans, we're well aware of this, um, the team can change throughout the season and the, and the team will get better. Look back at, at Duke's 2015 team, the one that won the national championship, that team seemed to have like like four different phases to its season where they look like a, a completely different team. So I, I see UNC actually being right, right there at the top with Duke and UVA and recovering a little bit of their, a little above their ranking from, from the beginning of the season. Cause up at the beginning of the season, I think they were ranked like four or five. They're down low, like at the, towards the bottom of the top 10 now. But I think that, that that's going to improve for them and we'll see any, any closing thoughts on the, on that, like, sort of top of the conference before we get into the uh, into the surprises and, and 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 spoiler for the surprises, I'm going to be touching on on NC State, so you'll you're going to be hearing a little more bit more about them from me than you did from Jason. But any any guys, anything else about sort of that top tier of the conference, or can we move on? I was going to say, I, I think it's going to be a very competitive ACC this year, and um, I you know we we went ahead and made these predictions, but um, I, it, we're not going to know the top of the conference, I don't think, for a long, long time, not just because it takes a while for the season to play out, but because I think there are a lot of teams that are contenders there. I mean, the fact that that we mentioned different clubs, uh, you know, there there are certainly teams like uh, like Clemson, um, like Miami, uh, like Syracuse, who we haven't talked a lot about, who it wouldn't be the shock of all shocks if they rose up and were contenders to be at the top of the conference um, the ACC is very deep, you know, like it always is, and uh, there there are no no easy wins out there, and so we're not going to know for a long time um, who who's really good in this league. Yeah, if we're if if the cutoff for um, getting an at large bid is like somewhere in the forties ish of the of the rankings, um, the ACC currently has nine teams that are that are higher than fiftieth in the Ken Palm rankings. So that's a that's probably a good barometer for how many teams are probably making the tournament from the ACC is, is nine. And, and so that, that, as you said, Jason, that shows that the, that the conference is going to be pretty competitive and outside that top 50 Miami, Notre Dame are still kind of lurking. They're, they're not far away from that. Um, you mentioned Pitt, Pittsburgh and, and Boston college and Georgia tech, probably a little bit farther beyond them. Um, but all those teams could somehow get a few good wins and, and, and hop back into the, into the into contention for uh, for a, for an NCAA tournament bid. I wanted to talk Wake, now. Wake, uh, Wake Forest is the only ACC team not ranked in the top 100. Yeah, I mean, I mean they they have to be firing Danny Manning at the end of this season, right? I mean, it, it may not, he may not make he may not make it that long. And also, I would say, you know, that last week of the ACC regular season, expect six teams to be in contention for that top seed. It's going to be a hell of a last week, I think. Yeah, and and of course, always looking ahead at that at that Duke UNC game to to cap off the year is, is always a good one. Guys, let's, let's talk a little bit about, about surprises so far in the season. So we said that, that the non-conference season is, is more or less wrapped up at this point. A couple teams still have like maybe one or two games left. Duke of course has the game against St. John's in, in a month in Cameron, but uh, effectively the non-conference season is, is over at this point. And we've got a good idea. Like what's interesting now at this time of the year is that the, Teams have all played their non-conference schedules, so that so as I was saying about how um, if you look at the how the how many ACC teams are like in the Ken Palm top fifty or, or top forty or so right now, that's sort of a good indicator of like how many of them are going to be left at the end of the season because we might jockey around within each other, um, but but ultimately it's like the 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 quality of the conference is already set, which means that we can look at the teams in the ACC not in the context of the conference but in the context of the of the whole country and look at who has surprised us in, in one way or another throughout the season. I'll let Donald go first. Donald, tell me about a, about a surprise team in ACC in, in the ACC based on their non-conference performance so far. Well, my surprise uh, may not be a surprise to people. Um, it is a team that is 
uh, located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And yeah, I'm talking about the Pitt Panthers. You know, of course, everyone's like, oh, that's the easy pick because they haven't won a conference game in almost two years. Um, so there's nowhere to go but up. But they're 10 and three on the season. They've played some tough teams so far. And even in their losses, they have played tough in those losses. Uh, we knew that Jeff Capel, um, former associate head coach of Duke, uh, would have his work cut out for him when he took this job uh, in the offseason. But we've seen steady improvement so far from the Pitt Panthers very early on. And I think they're going to surprise some teams this year. Are they going to be in the top half? Probably not. Um, the ACC is just like really, really loaded this year. And, and that's really not a fault to not be in the top half of this conference this year. But don't be surprised that they're, they're going to pick off a couple of teams. And when the ACC tournament rolls around, we're talking about Pitt as like a 10 or 11 seed. And that's one, like this, a seed that, you know, if you're a six or seven seed, that's trying to get one more win to kind of solidify uh, your, your place in the NCAA tournament. Or even, you know, if you're 10 seed or 11 seed, nine seed, look for them to be a tough out because toughness and determination can be instilled in the absence of great talent. Pitt does not have great talent yet. But I think we're seeing right now from Jeff Capel's team that toughness and determination can go a long way. And I think that's why they're going to be a team that people towards the end of the season are going to be like, well, especially in a, in a three to four game tournament, uh, if you're trying to go all the way, you know, having a team like that on day one is really going to zap your team's energy because they're going to play tough. They're going to play hard and they're not going to be the team that goes down easily. And, and you know, I think I like their future because he's, He's doing it with a lot of young guys, mm-hmm. um, and and we know that Capel's going to recruit. Um, I, I think he's going to he's he's already elevated Pitt's recruiting a little bit. He's going to elevate it a lot more, and and these young guys are getting experience. He's going to bring in more talent. I, they're not going to make the tournament this year. I mean, you know, let's not get crazy. Right. Um, but they'll be like you said, they'll be competitive. Uh, and I really, uh, Pitt is trending up. I, I fully expect, if not next year, the year after, we'll be talking about this team as top half of the ACC. And full credit to Mr. Capel for for getting them there. And also, honestly, I think with the performance that they have this year, there will be people who talk about Jeff Capel as the ACC coach of the year. If they're ten, nine, or a ten seed, um, and and basically leaving someone on the cusp of making the NCAA tournament. I, I think that's grounds that people will get votes. I don't know if he'll win it all, um, but I think he will get some serious consideration for ACC coach of the year for how he puts together these Panthers. And I mean, if they, if they win five or six games in the conference, isn't that like more than they've had in like the past four years combined? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they've been, they, they have been them and Boston college traditionally over the last few years have been pretty bad, but last year Pitt was terrible. I mean, they're kind of so in there's the, nobody to go for that. They're kind of in the pre-coach Cutcliffe Duke football position at this point. Not not quite as long suffering, obviously, because Pittsburgh right. has made an NCAA tournament in the last six years or, or eight years or so. Yeah. But um, but certainly in that like like you, I think the way you put it, Donald, was there's nowhere to go but up for them. So uh, yeah, I, I think winning four or five games in the conference this year would be a good accomplishment. And as Jason pointed out, it's a it, it, it's also looking good on the recruiting front for them. Jeff Capel is of course a a, a very capable, capable, capable uh, recruiter. <laughs> so uh, um, things things should be trending up for Pittsburgh um, pretty soon. Jason, why don't you tell me about your surprise team? So I'm going with Virginia Tech, um, a, a team that a lot of people expected to be good, but I don't think people expected them to be this good. Um, they are the fifth best offensive team in the land, according to Ken Pomeroy, number five. They are also the 27th best defensive team. So uh, anytime you're, you know, top five offense, top 30 defense, that's a heck of a club. I mean, Virginia Tech is really good. Ken Pomeroy has them as the number nine team in the nation. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that's, that's impressive. Um, their only loss was a one-point loss to Penn State. And I, I, I still – can't understand or explain how they lost that game. It was their first true road game of the year, so maybe they were just a little thrown playing on the road. Um, but uh, but other than that, Virginia Tech has has been um, very impressive. They haven't played many close games at all. They've they've been beating teams fairly soundly. They haven't. I mean, their schedule's been easy. Let, let's be clear about that. Um, their most impressive win they beat 
Purdue. And Purdue's really good. Purdue's a top 20 team, no question about it. They beat Purdue by six points. It was on a neutral floor, um, you know, no one's home court. Uh, but a six point win over Purdue's a, a big deal and a, a really nice win. They've also got a, a nice 12 point win over Washington, um, who might be the best team in the Big 12. Uh, I'm sorry, in the Pac 12. That's not saying very much. Pac 12 yeah. sucks. Do, do we want to do do be bragging about? <laughs> about wins over teams from one bid leagues i mean yeah right now. exactly yeah uh I, but washington's up there with arizona state and oregon as as the best teams um uh, you know and perhaps ucla maybe as the best teams in the pac 12 so hey i mean and and i mean they won that game by 12 points fairly easily um so i i i, I like what i mean virginia tech's 11 and 1 you don't get to be 11 and 1 unless you're a fairly good club and it, the or unless you is, or perhaps unless you schedule like seth greenberg yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, the interesting thing about NC, I'm St- uh, sorry about about Virginia Tech. To me, is free throws. It's there, there's just a really cool advanced stat about Virginia Tech and free throws. They are terrible. Like they're among the bottom ten percent in the country at getting to the free throw line, but they're amazing at defending without fouling. This is the best team in the country at opponent's free throw rate, not free throw percentage. I mean, look, you can't, there's no defense for a guy standing at the line unguarded. Excuse me, excuse me. As a graduate student at Duke, I would beg to differ on that that front. Your crowd, right, your crowd handles your free throw defense. But Virginia Tech doesn't let teams get to to the free throw line, which is a really interesting, I mean, it shows that this is a disciplined team, Um, they are very experienced of the five guys who play the most for them. Three of them are seniors and one is a junior. And then the other one is a sophomore. That's Nikhil Alexander Walker, who's their best player. Um, uh, but they're, they're a very, very experienced team. And by the way, they're also a really good three point shooting team. They hit 44% from long range. That is really, really good. They're the third best three-point shooting team in the country. Uh, they don't play a lot of guys with size. Kerry Blackshear is really the only true big man they have, but all their guards are good at at rebounding for guards, and so they're a fairly good rebounding team. Um, and and I, I just think this Virginia Tech team, look, you tell me if it's a team that doesn't foul, that shoots good threes, that has a lot of guards who don't turn the ball over and they rebound well, I mean – kind of a no-brainer that this is a good team. I think this Virginia Tech team uh, absolutely could challenge for the very, very top of the ACC. Uh, They they are a really good team. And Nikhil Alexander-Walker is going to be a NBA draft pick after this season. This guy's for real. He's a very, very good player. He could, I wouldn't be entirely shocked if he gets in the running for first team all ACC. Great pick. Virginia Tech, as you noted, has been has been great in a number of ways. I wanted to talk a little bit more about NC State and Jason you you kind of touched on it a little bit when we were talking about the about the top of the conference, but I wanted to highlight again on on NC State just uh you know they like Virginia Tech, they've had an easier uh or actually very easy non-conference schedule. We we've we've discussed I think a couple times here on the show about all these ACC teams not exactly scheduling tough opponents early Embarrassingly in the season. Bad. It is embarrassingly yeah. bad. NC but State's NC State's had NC State's had two games against premium opponents. Uh, they lost at Wisconsin in the ACC Big Ten Challenge, and and it was looking like, oh no, NC State, what's happening to them? But a couple weeks ago, they had Auburn come visit them in Raleigh, and and looked not quite as comfortable as Duke did against Auburn in Maui, but but still had sort of a, a comfortable last eight, 10 minutes of the game where they were in the lead and just sort of cruised to the end of the game. And, and I, I was, I was watching that game sort of on and off and was like, Oh man, at what point is NC state going to blow this game and, and, and make it look like the non-conference season was, was a little bit more of a mess for them, but they held on. They looked really strong against an Auburn squad that Duke fans know is, is pretty competitive and, and should be there um, vying for a final four bid. So NC State had had that one great win. And in general, the thing that I like about them, uh, about Kevin Keats' squad, is is how experienced they are. They're, they've got a lot of juniors and seniors, led, of course, by Torin Dorn, um, who is, who, who's kind of the, the, the driver for that team this year. But they have a lot of experience. They've played in the ACC. They won a number of, of 
big upsets last year. Uh, so so Keats is used to coaching his teams in these big games. Of course, they they beat Duke last year. They also beat North Carolina. Um, they've got that win against Auburn already under the belt this year. So I don't expect the Wolfpack to be maybe as as scared as as they were in under previous coaches. Um, Kevin Keats seems to play with has his team playing with a lot of swagger and a lot of confidence. And I like the I like the way that they that that they have uh, a team led by by older guys. Um, and he's been pretty successful uh, bringing in transfers and, and beefing up the the roster with transfers, which is these days is is almost as important as the as the high school recruiting. Um, so uh, looking good for NC State and and also right there um, near the top, they're 22nd in Ken Palm right now. Uh, which is up a lot from where they were in the preseason. So, um, so I'm ex- still expecting, like Jason, I'm expecting big things from NC State this season. Uh, Duke is going to get them, I think, fairly early in the conference schedule. Is that right? Um, so we'll get to we'll get to get a get a better look at NC State pretty soon. So that's hey, going hey, to hey, yeah. Wait, wait. I I got an NC State comment. I just wanted to add something. One of the key reasons that NC State has been so good this year is. Teams don't hit three pointers against them. Do you know that NC State's opponents are only hitting twenty seven percent of their threes? That's terrible. Twenty seven percent. That is really, really bad. Um, well, it's a good thing. It's a good thing for Duke fans that that Duke is not a three point shooting team this year. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but I was going to say, I don't know whether that's a product of the fact that NC State has played terrible opponents. <clears throat> Sorry. I don't know whether that's a product of the fact that NC State has played terrible opponents. I mean, like really bad teams. Maybe these bad teams just can't shoot at all. Or maybe it's that NC State is really, really good at defending the three. But, but I mean, we'll find out, obviously, in ACC conference season. But if NC State can continue to hold teams to, you know, around 30% from three, they're, they're going to be really, really good this year and a tough out. Because they, on the other hand, shooting team, NC State, is the seventh best. I mean, I talked about Virginia Tech being one of the best teams in the country at shooting three-pointers. NC State is seventh best in the country. They're right behind Virginia Tech um, as one of the best three-point shooting teams in the land. The three-point line has become so unbelievably important in college basketball. Um, It's going to be really interesting to see how well Duke can do not really focusing that much on making threes. All right, I want to look ahead. So we, we've we've kind of talked in general about a lot of ACC teams. Of course, uh, you know, as we as we go through the conference schedule, we'll do this like we have in years past, where we will preview each of the teams that are coming up that week a little bit more in depth. So we're going to start that this week. Duke plays is going to host Clemson on Saturday for their ACC opener. And, uh, and, and the Clemson Tigers have been, have been pretty good this season. Um, Jason, I wanted you to kind of dive in and give me a little bit more about what we should expect to see for Duke against, uh, against Clemson on Saturday in Cameron. Uh, so I think that Clemson is the classic sort of like, yeah, they're, they're good, but nothing special. Um, this is a team that, um, both their offense and their defense, Ken Pomeroy rates their offense and their defense, both in like the mid forties. So yeah, mid forties, that's, they're good on offense, mid forties. Yeah, they're good on defense, but they're not great at either one of those. Um, they do try and slow the game down. They're going to play at a relatively slow pace. Um, but their problem, I, I mentioned it a second ago, three point, the three point line, um, and how important it is. Uh, they're, they're not good at three point defense. Opponents hit almost 39% of their threes, which is a high number. Um, you know, if you get around 40%, you're doing great. And the average Clemson opponent hits almost 40%. Um, and on the other side, Clemson's not good at shooting threes. They only hit 31% of their threes. I, I, I actually, I was looking at their schedule and Clemson hasn't beaten. I don't think anyone who's in the top 100 teams in Pomeroy, uh, their only wins that have, that are at all decent are Georgia and South Carolina, um, who are you know, pair of SEC teams, but they're mediocre SEC teams. They're not in the top 100. The The three good teams that Clemson has played, Creighton, Nebraska, and Mississippi State, who are all like, you know, top 30 kind of teams. These are teams that are, you know, probably going to make the NCAA tournament. They lost all three of them. Um, so uh, this, this Clemson club, uh, we had high expectations for them, I think. And I'm not sure they're meeting those expectations because they're really experienced. I mean, four of their top five players are seniors. 
and uh, and they run everything through Marquise Reed and Sheldon Mitchell, who who are their leading scorers and leading assist guys. Um, so uh, you know you would th- everything about Clemson in the past couple of years they've been fairly decent. Sort of pointed to this year as being another year that they'd be you know pretty good. They're okay, but they're not great. Um, and I, you know I I sort of have a tough time. I'm having a tough time seeing where they have matchups that they'll be able to exploit against Duke. It might be like a, a perfect game for Duke to get the ACC season started. Not that Clemson is like the easiest team, as you noted, Jason. They're sort of middle of the pack, probably on the on the like nine ten seed line type area in the A's, in the <laughs> NCAA tournament. Um, so perhaps a good team for for Duke to get started against. Donald, did you have anything to add about about the the team that probably came in second place in the Zion Williamson sweepstakes? Uh, not really, but I, I the one thing that I am curious to see from our standpoint is how our three point shooting uh, you know happens and it rebounds because uh, if you notice the last couple games we had after what was another like 10, 11 day break uh, against Princeton and Texas Tech our three-point shooting wasn't that great. And it was really about the rust that you see from a team that has obviously had a long layoff. Well, this is another long layoff. We've had almost two weeks. It'll be almost two weeks, uh, over two weeks, actually, um, since the last game, once these guys take the court against Clemson. Uh, and I'm interested to see how that rust, uh, how, how quickly that rust wears off. We're obviously going to see a little bit of it. Um, but I, I'll be interested to see if our three-point shooting comes around and, and really the last – couple games our free throw shooting has been fantastic can we maintain that because uh, as we get into ACC season those are going to be the keys um, uh, amongst other things if we are good at three-point shooting and we're good at finishing at the line um, people are going to have a difficult time beating us so uh, it'll be good to get that back on track and see how that flows against Clemson Let's hope that the rims in Cameron this weekend are extra soft as we are coming out of break Guys, I just wanted to note here uh, as we're going to wrap up the basketball discussion right before we're done. Um, I want to I want to quickly touch on one of our predictions from the preseason. Uh, we uh, I, I asked you guys to predict Jack White's total minutes. I said four hundred. Donald said two fifty. Jason said three hundred. Uh, through whatever it is, twelve games at this point, Jack White's already played three hundred minutes. So I think we're all going to be um, pretty far under on the on the Jack White minutes prediction, but did I but say two fifty? I said twenty five hundred. Oh, I said. oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I <laughs> must have I must have just left that. I left that out. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. I I thought we were predicting minutes per game. I was I didn't say. Oh three, yes, 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 thirty yes. minutes, three hundred, three hundred <laughs> minutes per game. What? A, <laughs> how silly of me. I must have I must have done a poor job with the bookkeeping. <laughs> you're gonna win that one, Sam. You're, yeah, you're gonna yeah, win yeah. that. This episode of the Duke Basketball Report podcast is brought to you by the boys of Bird Campbell, PA, with law offices in Texas and Florida. Bird Campbell means business. All right, so we're going to... We're going to leave basketball off to the side for a minute because I don't even know if I teased this at the top of the show, but Duke finished the football season. We're going to, we're going to quickly talk about this. We're going to wrap this up. The, the football season is now over for the Blue Devils, although it's still, still happening for, for a couple of the top teams in the land. Uh, Duke finished, finished this very weird football season with a rout of the Temple Owls in the Walk-Ons Independence Bowl which the the name of which we covered extensively, I think, in the last show. Um, so it was 56-27. Duke ran away from Temple at the end. I think that the the uh, trend that we talked about earlier this season about how Duke is is so dominant in the second half of games, that came that meme came roaring back in in this game. So Donald, I'm gonna start with you. Tell me about uh, Duke in the Independence Bowl this year. Well, you you started off with it. Uh, zero points. They gave up zero points in the second half. Now uh, the first half was kind of a struggle. Um, you know, we scored on our first drive. Then we scored on our second drive, but the, the person who scored the touchdown actually was wearing a Temple shirt. Um, so we, we threw a pick six on the second uh, second uh, possession that we had. And 
Temple at a certain point just kind of took over in the first half. And, and it was, it wasn't that we didn't have an answer for it. It was more that we just weren't, we were kind of out of sorts. Uh, we had some guys you know, strike me if you've heard this before, um, but injuries, uh, we had a couple guys who were injured and we had a couple guys who were filling in for, for people who were injured, for people who were injured all the way down the line. I think we we're probably on our 19th string defensive uh, backs at, at a certain point in the game. But at halftime, I'm not sure what Coach Cut and the staff were telling their players. But I think for next season, I want them to start the game by telling them that because they came out just absolutely manhandled t- Temple the second half. Seven straight possessions ended in a touchdown. Seven straight. That was from the second quarter through the end of the game. And Temple had no response after, uh, you know, opening quarter where we, or in the third quarter where we scored 21 points. That was it. Temple did not really sniff uh, much of a possession with the football after that. And, the, you know, at the end of the game, they were talking about some of these players who uh, could make it to the next level. And they're talking about Daniel Jones. I know we talked about this, you know, you know, quite a bit this season about his draft stock. But Daniel Jones may have played his way not just into the first round, guys, but into the top 10 uh, draft picks in, in the 2019 NFL draft. It's just a matter of whether he decides to go out. But if you're going to be a top 10 pick, we may have seen the last game that Daniel Jones has played in, in a Duke uniform, but 30, 30 receptions, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 30 completions for 423 yards and five touchdowns. Uh, yeah, that's the way to go out if that is your last game uh, as a Duke Blue Devil. Uh, can, I throw, can, I, huh? can I throw cold water a little bit on the whole Daniel Jones NFL thing? He yeah, did this again. Do, because I think it's, and, and honestly, I think uh, before you say anything, I, I think when we hear people talk about Daniel Jones being like a ninth or 10th pick in the draft, we have to stop ourselves because we're like, are we the ones that are out of, out of whack with this? Because we don't think that's going to happen. We don't think that should happen, but go ahead. Look, I I don't doubt that he is shaped like Peyton Manning or Aaron Rodgers, and that he, he can throw the ball really far and that he makes good reads. Um, But the defense that he, the defenses that he has shredded this year are the likes of Temple and UNC, not the Clemson's and Miami's of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, 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 I am, in, I want Daniel Jones to succeed. I would love for him to be like a great NFL player for many, many years, but I really would have preferred to see him uh, demonstrate that talent against, against the top defense and not, and not sort of the, that middle of the pack or, or bottom of the ACC type of uh, uh, type of defense. And, and in this game, I mean, man, what a, what a boon for the, for the TV broadcasters in this game, because I feel like the only notes they brought in with them were the ones about Daniel Jones having conversations with Peyton Manning and mm-hmm. lucky for them, Daniel Jones just kept throwing touchdowns and kept running for touchdowns and even threw himself a pass at one point. So yeah. <laughs> they, they, they were able to just keep harping on the, on the same topic for three hours. I was, I was dizzy by the end of the game. And, um, hey, Hey, Hey Sam. Of, uh, wait, NFL. Yeah. What? You, you, slow your roll for a second because Temple's a really good defensive team. Like Temple made it to this to this game. Temple won eight games on the back of their defense. They are, an, uh, a, I mean, they're an excellent defensive team. And and Daniel Jones absolutely shredded them. And and, and I'll, I'll I'll say another thing. Um, I, I think if Daniel Jones decides to come back to Duke, I, I'll I'll be shocked and disappointed because. There is there is no reason for him to return to Duke. It, it makes no sense whatsoever. First of all, a, he has to win the Heisman four, Trophy he, next year. He has to win the Heisman he, Trophy next year, and he's got he's a great opportunity right at the beginning of the season against Alabama. It's going to be a it's going to be a big time matchup. See you there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm I'm going to go with reality. <laughs> um, he has been at Duke for four years. People forget that he redshirted his freshman year. So Daniel Jones has a Duke degree. He's He's graduating in a couple months. Um, what's more, this is going to be a very weak quarterback class. Um, there are not a lot of the guys who've declared or the guys who are seniors. It's just not a, a class of great quarterbacks um, in terms of the NBA, uh, sorry, the NFL draft. Whereas next year is probably going to be a incredibly deep. I mean, they're talking about four or five guys already, not including Daniel Jones in next year's draft class who are going to be first rounders for probably at least three of them who will go in the first seven or eight picks. Um, 
So if Daniel Jones comes out this year, you guys are right. There's talk he could be a top 10, top 15 pick, and he's almost certainly a first rounder. If he comes out next year, even if he has a great season, he could easily be like a third round draft pick. And and, and again, he he's a senior. He's graduating. He would have to come back and do a year of grad school. I Daniel Jones is not returning to Duke. That's fine. I, I mean, he's had a great career. He's been here for four years. He finishes it with a with a huge, unbelievable game. What more could you ask for? And and, and the last thing I'll say about this topic is I actually think having Daniel Jones get drafted, especially in the first round by, you know, I don't know, a lot talk about the New York Giants. There's, you know, talk, you know, they're they're teams that need quarterbacks. Um, if Daniel Jones, if, if Coach Cutcliffe takes a kid who was a two-star recruit um, and turns him into a first-round NFL draft pick quarterback, I think that does a tremendous amount for Duke's recruiting going forward for kids wanting to come play for Coach Cutcliffe. Probably, probably it does more than if Daniel Jones comes back to school next year. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm. I'm more bearish, I would say, perhaps on like his long term prospects as opposed to as opposed to what he should do in the short term, which I totally agree with you on. And it's it's a combination of Jason, as you said, the like his current reality, which is, you know, that he's being projected as a as a top pick. He's already graduated. And more importantly, like you said, next year's class is loaded to a tongue of Iloa is coming out. Um, there's a lot of other guys who, who are, are going to be, um, in that, in that QB class. So let's, um, let's finish though with the, with the temple game, Jason, did you have anything else on, um, on Duke's big win in the independence bowl? Yeah. So I I want to, I want to make an admission. Um, (laughs) so it was about, you know, midway through the second quarter or so. And, um, you know, it wasn't looking great. For Duke, um, we were down at the time. I, I want to say we were. We may have even been down um, two touchdowns. But uh, uh, there was a play where <clears throat> um, where TJ Ramming didn't really get open too well, um, and and you know I was getting a little frustrated. I, I thought our receivers were were dropping passes. Daniel Helm had a bad drop at one point, um, and uh, guys weren't getting open. This was again early in the game when Duke wasn't looking great on offense, and and sort of lamenting the Duke receiving and, and uh, my friends all responded, three or four of them responded with, with comments about, you know, uh, you know, Oh, this is the last game of TJ Ramming's career. And I won't be sorry to see him go. You know, people were saying he's, he's not great at receiving, at, at receiving punts. And we were kind of banging on TJ Ramming a little bit. Look, this is what people do in private sometimes. Um, <laughs> and, and then <laughs> he went out and had, the best second half probably of any receiver in any bowl game in ACC history. He set a record for, for yardage receiving in, in the ACC uh, in a bowl game, 240 yards receiving. And by the end of the game, we're all messaging each other saying, I don't know if TJ was looking at our, at our emails, but boy, were we wrong. Yeah. So he heard you. Wanted, yeah. He heard us. <laughs> so I just wanted to tip my cap to TJ Ramming, who uh, as a senior in his final game, has far and away his best game, arguably, arguably the best game ever. Not just in a bowl game. Period. End of story. Best game ever, perhaps by by a Duke receiver. So props, props to TJ. And then the last thing I wanted to bring up, uh, a friend of mine alerted me to this stat, and I was like, "That's unbelievable." Uh, so Duke has been playing football for a long time since the 1880s. Um, that Duke has been playing football. And, um, and look, I know there weren't, there weren't bowl games back there in the 1880s, but the bowl games have been around for a long, long time. Uh, with this uh, win um, this past week, David Cutcliffe now has three, three victories in, in bowl games. Um, did you know that every other coach in Duke history not named David Cutcliffe, the not Cutcliffes, they also have exactly three bowl wins. David Cutcliffe has as many bowl victories as every other Duke coach in history combined. That's that's kind of all three of those while is Wade. Yeah, they well, uh, they, uh, was Wade around for the 1961 Cotton Bowl? No, I think he no, might. No, have. no, no. <laughs> Wallace Wade would have been long gone by then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So Wallace Wade won in 1945 and 1955, and then Duke won the Cotton Bowl in 1961, and Duke didn't win another bowl game for for 50 years 
years. <laughs> 50 years yeah. until 54 years until we won the pinstripe bowl. Um, but David Cutcliffe, I mean, like, I, you know, and another crazy stat. So Cutcliffe has now been to six bowl games. The not Cutcliffe's, every other coach in Duke history, eight bowl games. Cut's been to six. They've been to eight. Cut's won three. They've won three. I mean, if we're talking about all-time Duke football coaches, there's Wallace Wade, there's Steve Spurrier, there's a whole bunch of other guys, and there's David Cutcliffe. Um, it's obviously not, it's not the, it's not the, Perhaps the proudest history, but but Cutcliffe is right there as as one of the as one of the goats, perhaps at Duke. Donald, why don't you uh, why don't you wrap up this uh, this football discussion, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll round out the show with the parting shots. Yeah, I, w- what I was going to say is, you know, from a neutral standpoint, this game was actually very entertaining on both sides. You know, there was a lot of points scored, and for ESPN, I'm sure they were more than thrilled to have this game on as the first game. After that dreaded Cheez It Bowl that was ten to seven in <laughs> overtime, that was the worst game ever. It was terrible. Perhaps, I, perhaps though, it was the best game ever. I mean, no, no, there was no. nothing good about that game. That they had nine interceptions. I turned the game on, and there was six interceptions in a span of ten actual real time minutes. That's just incredible. But I, I'm sure people were happy to note that with about five minutes left in the first quarter. Uh, we had already out, you know, surpassed that output that the the entire Cheez It Bowl did in overtime. So, uh, props to both teams for an entertaining game, uh, and I'm sure ESPN was was over the moon happy that they were able to kick off what was a great day of uh, of bowl coverage um, with a such an entertaining game um, in a bowl game that people generally don't care about, but people care about entertaining games. And what Duke has proved over the last few years is that we can put on a show in a bowl game. And I think that is something that will endear ourselves to bowl committees going forward. You give David Cutcliffe time to prepare. He's going to beat your ass. Wow. All right. That's a, that's a great way to sum it up. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So great season, Duke football. And we'll be, we'll be covering the game. Uh, Duke's next game is uh, Labor Day weekend in Atlanta uh, against Alabama coming up in 2019. I I, I assume we're all going to be there. Uh, Yes. I'm going to get Donald, live Donald, show. Live show. Donald says he's going to be here. Uh, I'm I'm definitely going to be there. I've I've been talking to a number of my classmates about because normally during Labor Day weekend, a lot of Fuqua students will like go to the beach. Um, but we're foregoing that next year to to spend the weekend in Atlanta at the game. Jason lives there, so uh, are we all going to be? Are we all going to be at the Duke Alabama game next year? Live show. Here we go. I'm going to get press tickets. I'm going to get press tickets. I'm going to be. I'm going to sit on press row. That's what I want to do. Oh, look at look at fancy Jason here. <laughs> I, I am not going to do that. <laughs> uh, no, I'm going to be I'm going to be drinking in the parking lot. Uh, Amen. So, Donald, Donald, we 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 can do that. Maybe Jason can join us after the game. All right, guys, let's um let's finish the show like we do normally with the with the parting shots. Obviously, there's no. Well, you want to pick uh, you want to pick players of the game from the football game. I mean that you know you you've got a couple of good choices. Why don't we why don't we do that very quickly and then and then we'll do the parting shots. Does that sound good? That sounds good um, to me. Donald, Donald, give me your your player of the week from Duke's bowl game against Temple. Okay, uh, my player of the week is I, I'm going to pressure Jason to take TJ Ramming so that I can take Daniel Jones. Okay, I was going to say I like that. Who, I like whoever. That. Whoever Donald takes, I'm going to say I got the other guy. So you took Daniel Jones. I'll take TJ Ramming because Boom. I was banging, I was banging on him in emails, and then he went out and, and went for 240 yards receiving. That's just sick, sick man. I I complained I complained about TJ Ramming a lot. Uh, I don't know if it was on the show or just to my friends, but it, I like D- Jason. I, I always sort of had the same thought you did. It's just like man, he, it seems like he's good. Um, it, it seems like he's he, he should be better than he is and, and never quite lived up to it. And then, like you said, in the last half that he gets to play in a Duke uniform, he just went totally nuts. So yeah, I'll give it to I'll give it to TJ Ramming. Um and and perhaps Daniel Jones comes back and I get to give him one I get to give him one next year. Uh let's do parting shots then now that we've now that we've cleaned up on the on the player of the week. Jason, uh you go first. Let me hear your parting shot for uh, for the new year. So 
so my parting shot, unfortunately, isn't a very long one. I know, you know, people go, hey, Jason, he's going to talk for a while. <laughs> All season long, since the preseason, we have struggled to come up with a way to describe Zion Williamson. I mean, am I right, guys? <laughs> this, is, this is something that, that people have labored with. And leave it to none other than Javin Delorier. Javin Delorier this week came up with the perfect description. There was an article in the Sporting News about Zion Williamson and R.J. Barrett and positionless basketball and all that other kind of stuff. Look, the, the media is doing nothing but talking about Duke these days. And Javin Delorier had a description for Zion Williamson that I think is perfect. Gentlemen, are you ready for this? I don't know. Are we? Okay. Okay. Javin said of Zion, it's hard to stop a bulldozer that can fly. A flying bulldozer, ladies and gentlemen. I think that is the perfect description of Zion Williamson. Wait, and did you see did you see what the Duke basketball uh, social media crew uh-huh. put together after that? They drew up a cartoon uh, bulldozer like blue, giant blue evil looking bulldozer with a number one jersey on it. <laughs> um, it was. Uh, I did it, not. That's it, awesome. Yeah, that's it's awesome. pretty fierce. I find that. Yeah, I think it's on. It's either on their Instagram or like on their Twitter. But it's uh, it, it's pretty fierce looking. I would. I'd drive one around. Seems seems appropriate for me. Uh, Jason, I love that. Donald, uh, give me your parting shot. So I have a couple quick ones. Uh, the first one was um, uh, a couple nights ago. The Golden State Warriors took on the Portland Trailblazers, so we had an opportunity to see some Curry on Curry crime. Uh, And what I'm talking about is uh, there was a point in the second half where Steph Curry uh, was getting just destroyed by Seth Curry. Um, And what I mean destroyed, I mean getting shots rained on in his face by his younger brother, um, which was really funny to see because they were kind of jawing and clowning with each other the entire game. Um, And and eventually the Portland Trailblazers won in a comeback uh, last second shot and overtime. They then went to Portland and had another game just, I think, last night. And uh, Golden State ended up winning that game. But after the game, the two ki- the two brothers exchanged jerseys, uh, which has become more of a tradition uh, in, in the NBA circles. It was, it was really cool to see, but it was kind of cool to see uh, the two Curry brothers going at it. And my second parting shot was the other night I was uh, fortunate enough to go to uh, the Wizards-Bulls game. So I got my first chance to check out Wendell Carter Jr. for the first time. Uh, in Hold the on, NBA. Donald, Donald, yeah. Donald, don't say, don't, don't tell me you went to a Wizards Bulls game and you were like, man, I get to go to a Wizards Bulls game. Uh, don't. So, <laughs> I, so, so I will say, I, I, you guys know me, I'm a Pistons fan. I hate the Bulls. Um, my friend was in town. It was her, it's her birthday today, actually. Happy birthday, Rosie. Uh, and she wanted to go to her first NBA game. Um, and so I was, I, I work a block away from, uh, the Capital One Center or Verizon Center, whatever we call it now. Um, the phone I think booth. We, I, I was going to say those of us, those of us Wizards old school DC Bulls folks, are still calling MCI it. We're still calling yeah. it the phone booth. Yeah, yeah, the phone, phone booth. booth. Hey, wait, hold, dude, hold on. Wizards Bulls. You wanted to take her to an NBA game, and you took her to a no, Wizards no, 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 Bulls. No, no, yeah, oh. you didn't hear me. She wanted okay. to go to a game, and she asked me if I wanted to come with her. And since I work a block away, I said yes, I will go to a basketball game that is a block away from me. Of course, I will. But it was my first time to see Wendell Carter play a lot as a, as a bull. And guys, he played really well. Um, he was getting rebounds. He was dunking over people. Um, he was very fluid in the paint and looked like he didn't look like a rookie. Um, so I wanted to give a shout out to him, even though he plays for a, a team that I hate. Um, he is doing very well for the Chicago Bulls. They ended up winning that game because everybody beats the Wizards. Um, but well, uh, well, actually, I would say that's probably one of the more competitive games you'll see the Wizards play this year. Right? Because, yeah, uh, but uh, cause it was because the, the Bulls are the Bulls are a tire fire. Right, but uh, there is one bright. <laughs> They're spot. not as bad as the Cavs. They're not as bad as the Cavs. Oof. No, no one's as bad as the Cavs. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I want to give a shout out to Window Carter uh, for having a great game when I was in the building to see him. Um, and hopefully he keeps that up the rest of the season. All right, let's go from talking about the bad teams to talking about the good teams. I was parked on the couch yesterday to watch the college football playoff, The uh, w- which I, I think some people like to quibble with, with like, what's the best thing for the sport? Like, does it, does it make sense for like more teams to be great? Does it make sense to have few? I love it um, in this day and age, seeing the good teams be dominant. Um, so, 
so I had a great time yesterday watching Clemson just run all over Notre Dame and, and Trevor Dang Lawrence here. looked like Trevor Lawrence looked like Aaron Rodgers playing against playing against Notre Dame. And then in the second game, Alabama came out and 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 blitzed uh, Oklahoma pretty hard. Oklahoma ended up making it a bit of a game in the second half, but but it never felt like Oklahoma was actually going to come back and win the game. So so looking ahead at next week, we're getting we're getting the same championship game that we've gotten what the last three years is that right? It's uh it's it's Bama no, no, and Clemson last, last year. Oh, they last they, year they played Bama. in the semifinal one year, right? Yeah, yeah. They yeah. played yeah. semifinal last year. Right, right, right. So we basically get to see the the, the Bama Clemson game every year, and you know what? It's always great. So I'm excited because because not many teams. Not many teams have the ability to beat Alabama. Like we, we know that, like maybe Georgia can, maybe LSU can, maybe Auburn can, but but Clemson has the ability to do that, and we'll get to see it another time next week. It's it's Trevor Lawrence and and Tua um, in the national championship game, which is exactly what it's supposed to be, and and I am going to enjoy it. Uh, why don't we Why don't we quickly to wrap up here do do a little bit of prediction game on the uh, college football playoff championship game. Donald, give me your, give me your final score for Bama Clemson. Uh, so before I do this, is there a que- there's a question. I know Clemson had three guys suspended, including a couple starters. Are they also yeah. suspended for the championship game? Almost I don't certainly, think, yeah. I, yeah, no, I think they, they will they be. Haven't, they haven't announced it officially, but they probably are. They probably are. So given that, I, I, as much as I love Clemson and, and how they've played all year, including last night um, against Notre Dame, uh, I'm going to have to go with Alabama because Alabama for at least three quarters yesterday looked like they could beat any football team in the world uh, because they were, they were really good. So, and that was, uh, and, and that like, was them playing, and that was them playing sloppy. Like they right, had penalties right. and um, yeah. They, like it, it was 28 it nothing at one point and, and Nick Saban was furious with his team. And he was like throwing his, he was like throwing his headset and yep. yeah, it was, it was great. Jason, so I'm going to uh, go with Alabama. All right. Donald's got Alabama. Jason, you want to you you going to pick Alabama as well? See, I feel like whenever everyone is saying one thing, you should always pick the opposite. Except this time, this Alabama team is going to. I mean, they're they're going to they're going to beat Clemson. I, in fact, I think they'll beat them fairly easily. I I think Alabama wins by more than two touchdowns. Fine. You know what? I'll take Clemson. Uh, right. This is not our. This is not our. Uh, this is not our area of expertise, if we have any at all. So why not? Uh, I'll I'll will pick the ACC team. They looked completely dominant yesterday, and uh, perhaps they'll be they'll be confident. The one last thing that I did want to highlight, if folks didn't see it, and may, I, I hope you guys saw this, one of the uh, Alabama defensive linemen was being interviewed earlier this week, and almost almost admitted that he doesn't think Kyler Murray's that good. Did you see this clip? I the uh, yeah, I don't remember which guy it was, but he was being interviewed, and and the um, the reporter asked him. He said, he said, "What do you think?" Uh, he said something along the lines of like, of like, have you guys played anybody like Kyler Murray or any any quarterbacks who look like Kyler Murray? And of course, Kyler Murray like won the Heisman Trophy. He's a two sport star. He's Alabama or he's Oklahoma's quarterback. And uh, and the Alabama defensive lineman was like, "Yeah, well, we haven't we haven't really played anybody like him before, but I don't really know if Kyler Murray is is." And then he sort of paused and 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 his face relaxed and he looked back at the reporter and the reporter was like, go on. And he's like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> so um, he almost he almost gave Kyler Murray bulletin board material, but then it, it's like uh, it's like Nick Saban was had had the shock collar on him and and sort of just like turned it up and 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 that was that for uh, for his commentary. Anyway, that it was a fun one. You can go look that up. Um, anything else, guys? I think we're I think we're all set for this week. We'll be back. After Duke uh, opens the ACC basketball season against Clemson next week, we'll we'll run down uh, what happens in that game, and then we'll look ahead at the next couple of games coming up. But it's ACC basketball season. Everyone's excited. Well, we're excited. I hope everyone else is excited uh, for for conference play to start. It's it's one of the best times of the year, of course, and uh, and so we're looking forward to that. So for Jason Evans. And for Donald Wine, I am Sam Klein. This has been episode 140 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. Thanks again to our sponsors, Bird Campbell, for sponsoring the show. Duke Band, take us home.